Hello and welcome from Greece. I'm welcoming today Esther Feltheim and our topic is, but why? Hello, Esther. Welcome. Hello, Rene. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've been waiting for this moment a long time. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Esther, I'd like to introduce you to uh, my viewers first, so they have an idea of uh, who you are. Um, dear viewers, Esther is actually my Reiki teacher from Reiki One. We just before the recording spoke about that. It was, I think, the year 1990 in Hong Kong. So I have a long and very close relationship with Esther. Um, she is the creator of the Breakthrough System, and she is co-founder of the International Body Talk Association, IBA. She resides in Europe, Brexit permitting, that is, and currently I believe she is en route somewhere. Uh, and she teaches advanced interactive workshops in Breakthrough. She also runs Breakthrough instructor training programs. Esther is the author of Beyond Concept, The Investigation of Who You Are Not, and of the book, Who Am I? The Seeker's Guide to Nowhere. My connection with Esther, as I said, she is my Reiki teacher, and um, together with her husband, actually, John Feldheim, she uh, and he have been our trainers, my wife's and my trainers, to become Reiki teachers in the early 90s. Um, they uh, are the founders of the Reiki Network, and in 1996, they co-wrote and published a milestone book, Reiki, Science, Metaphysics, and Philosophy, um, that's Esther. So this morning when uh, I said to Misha, my wife, give me three words, quick, don't think, um, <clears throat> describing uh, Esther. She said, multilingual, traveler, and a close friend. No. So <laughs> welcome, Esther. <laughs> Thank you. That was very sweet. Thank you. Oh, so did, I, did I do all right with the introduction or would you like to add something? No, that, that was already a lot. <laughs> well, uh, we have, of course, a very unusual title uh, to our, our talk today. But why? And of course, I think uh, it was Esther's suggestion for the title, mind you. Uh, and of course, I think that why is the most stupid question in the world, uh, because why doesn't answer how um, and is not solution orientated. So we're going to explore a little bit why we have the title. That's obvious. Uh, but why? Um, and maybe you want to expand on that a little bit, Esther, when we had our conversation a few days ago uh, in preparation, what are we going to talk about? Uh, you said um, a lot of the work I'm doing today uh, revolves uh, around deconstructive thinking. Uh, and I said, OK, we can take that as a title. And you thought, no, you'd rather have. But why? So why do we have this title? <laughs> Well, I'll give you a long answer. <laughs> um, a, a, a while ago, I heard a term describing the, the child's mind, and uh, they used the term lantern mind. And the lantern mind, for me, was just such a wonderful description of how the child's mind functions. It immediately made me think of um, when I was living in Bavaria, you know, with my little friend Mala and uh, once a year they have a lantern festival and we would wait till nightfall and all the children families would go down to um, the 
little square in the village uh, with their homemade lanterns. And in this big pool of light, we'd walk around the village singing lantern songs and along the riverside. And, uh, and that, that immediately that image came to me. And then the other image she uses is for the, the adult's mind, which is the, the um, spotlight mind where we're more, well, narrow-minded, uh, we're more focused uh, in, you know, just uh, everything around us is isolated. We focus in a, in a much narrower way. And so, um, so I thought that that's a really good way of describing, I think, the work that I do, my focus. Um, is that so, so, why does what how does that happen forgetting any scientific reasons how does that happen that uh, that we go from lantern mind where we have this great peripheral taking everything into to this narrow what happens to us you know? and also the way children ask questions so a children ask children ask questions from the lantern mind from a place that's um uh, but that doesn't have a lot of answers already. Everything's fresh and they're curious and, and they particularly adults will say things and then a child will respond, but why? Oh, don't remind me, please. <laughs> I know. So we're like, shut up. And it's, yeah, so it, it can be a lot, but still a child really truly wants to, to understand, yes? So they have, whereas we have so many understandings and like we go on Google and we'll, with an understanding we already have, we will ask why and how. Yeah, so we're not ever really asking clear, undiluted questions. We're always starting from a place of I know something and then how and why. And then we have that, what do you call it on the internet, that uh, how it's filtered according to our prejudices. Yes. The yeah, algorithms with their own filter out uh, yes. uh, our preferences and will defeat us exactly the information. We, uh, our our uh, craving ego probably uh, needs or whatever uh, the driving engine, subconscious uh, mind, uh, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, I still see a validity in um, questioning the value of the question why. Um, because, uh, okay, it, it invites somewhat to an analytical kind of uh, looking at things. And I found also in my daily work, I find that uh, this very often is confusing people more than anything. And mostly it doesn't help them to to get on with their lives and find uh, solutions which makes their life more comfortable, which makes them more happy. So the question why uh, in itself, um, I, I tell me a little bit about deconstructive thinking. Uh, what do you mean by that? And, and I know that uh, your work revolves around or maybe more precisely, has the aim of creating breakthrough moments for individuals where they have like a mind opening away from this narrow-minded focus uh, and seeing beyond the, the filters and the blinkers and the limitations uh, which we all have uh, given by society, by growing up, by many, many influences where we where we uh, have inherited and been programmed with the mindset which we have. So breakthrough is obviously um, a, 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 a goal or a very important... Talk to me about breakthrough in relationship to why do we need to ask the question why to get through to a breakthrough? So, well... You know, we all have much, much more in common than, than we do differences. Although it would appear when we look out there as if differences are just, you know, huge and, and eclipse everything else. Um, 
but what we all have in common is that we that there's an expression in um uh, you know for the addiction is the only prison where the locks are on the inside um, and it seems to me from from really as tiny children we received this hand me down legacy of how to live life so this is really important part of growing up that we need to learn certain parameters and certain ways of being but the majority of these are really black and white and they've been handed down and become more and more rigid over time so whether they're religious political personal it's a, an accumulation of all of those and we hand it down and our mind then we start to take them in so i remember watching i've never had children but watching my my little friend as she went from two two and a half to three and seeing the shift just happening in her eyes um and as as she began to, but set, terrible to say, but to be programmed, as it were. Yes, so there was a, a sh and then more concerned about what people were thinking and and you saw things changing. Um, and the spontaneity wasn't the same, although she was still really small. And um, so I looked at, so basically breakthrough, we focus on what is it that makes life such a, appears such a struggle. So you look at little children, I think in India, you know, watching little children on the, on the garbage heaps, you know, trying to protect their little siblings from rats and, and yet they're making it a game and they're playing and, and somehow or other, they're still in the very worst of circumstances. A child still has that magical realm it, it, it inhabits. Huh? And then adults will say, well, yes, but then we have responsibilities. And this is part of the programming, yes? So there's a, an idea about this is what needs to happen, this is what will happen, this is how it should happen. And so we start to live from these recipes for living, these really rigid expectations we have expectations for ourselves, expectations for others, expectations of love, of life. And they are all our shoulds and shouldn'ts and cannots. And they are huge, huge lists. And it might seem oversimplifying, but they're the mother of all our defenses because we've learned this is how I should be. So they alienate us from what's natural to us. And oftentimes what we're taught is right and what we're taught is wrong contradicts our nature, you know, what comes naturally to us. Um, and so uh, we live a, a, a life where being ourselves becomes a liability. And much of the time we are mistaking expectations for goals and dreams and something positive. And when I work with people and work with looking at exploring their expectations, usually there's a whole list of reasons why those expectations are very valid and why they need them. And they all boil down to keeps me safe. So they're black and white thinking. And yet the idea is keeps me safe. Because but let me interrupt you. If you if you change that, then people are unsafe. Then they're they feel or they're afraid of I don't know uh, that they're uh, vulnerable, that they're losing their earthing, that they're losing their their grounding, their the safety net of their environment. Isn't that true? Well, that's what what we're told is the safety net. Yes, the familiar. So. Um, I was thinking the other day, you know, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle's book, is so popular. You know, I think I would entitle my book The Power of Ambiguity. You can imagine how few people would buy that. <laughs> but really, so all our expectations are geared against the unexpected, against the unknown, yes, against ambiguity, which are actually all the key, against change. 
unless I'm controlling the change, unless it yeah. leaks the way. And so these are all, what do these, what do these represent? Change, ambiguity, the unexpected. What do they all represent? They're life, no? So all our expectations guard against life. So what, what breakthrough, I mean, the focus is not just to, to give people just ahas. It's really, it's not, and it's not to get rid of anything. It's not to change anything. And that's the problem. So we decide, well, then I'm going to have a lot of, I'm going to make a list of power of positive thinking yeah, to, to superimpose on top of these, these rules. But that's just another list of expectations. Yeah. Yeah. So no, all we need to do is to see what what's there. You know, what is it that's fueling the fear? What does it look like? And when we explore it in breakthrough, you get to see for every positive, seeming positive um, conviction, there's one that contradicts it. And so the mind is full of contradictions. Give me so, an example, please. Yeah, now I'm trying to think of one. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, well, I'm, first one that comes to mind is, so people should be polite. You know, yes. The simple one. Where do, yes. where do we get if people are impolite? We have war and struggles all the time. They must be polite. So it should be like this. And the progression of thinking is until it is, so, so why, do you need to, why do you need it to be that way? Yes, yeah, because when people are impolite, I feel bad. Yeah. So it comes down that, so people make me feel bad when they're rude. Yeah. So you should be polite. Basically, what they're saying is until, until your behavior changes, I can't, I can't feel better. Yes, yeah. so I'm, my... I'm... And I'm naming the conditions of your behavior at the same time. You have to follow those rules so I feel comfortable and safe with you. So in other words, you need to limit yourself. You need to change yourself before I can change, before I can feel better. And of course, there's the huge part of that is you make me feel. So all the time saying responsibility is in your hands and somebody else's hands for my feelings. So in, in breakthroughs, one explanation, I give an analogy. Of, so we all live from these expectations, which are basically overreactions to life. Yeah, they're, uh, they're defending against life. So you think if you went to your doctor, and let's say you have national health, everything is paid for, and uh, you're just going for a regular checkup, and he says, oh, I don't know, Renee. No, you're looking a bit something strange. I really feel I need to do a whole bunch of tests, you know, but I feel fine. You know? Well, just to put my mind at rest, you know, just let me do that. You know? So he does all tests known to man, EGs, MRIs, P tests, blood tests, whole, and you're thinking, my goodness, you know, but you have time and, you know, it's on national health. So he says, so now in a few days, um, when the test results come back, uh, I'll phone you. So you're not worried, you feel fine. So then the phone call comes and he says, well, Renee, the results came in and um, I think you should come into my clinic to, for me to talk to you about it. So now you're getting a little worried, so you go in. And he says, well, Renee, you know, the, the, the test that I could redo, I redid, and I've gone over and over and over everything, but all the tests confirm the same thing. And um, look, I know that you think you're a man, but <gasps> actually, all these tests show that actually you're a bunny rabbit. So now what would you do in such a situation? Uh, if the result was that he would say, I'm a bunny rabbit, I'd probably laugh at him and say, it was nice knowing you and leave him. Right. I mean, every now and then someone says, I'd sue him. I... <laughs> yeah. Then you know they really need breaks. No. So, um, right. So why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you stand up and, and try to prove that you're a man? Why wouldn't you do that? Um, 
a good question because uh, I'd feel uh, the cause of what he has given me is so ridiculously stupid that I'm, I'm not going to buy into the stupidity of that. And in a way, what I'm answering to you is I feel superior to this stupidity and, and I would take the high road and leave him. But simple answer, why wouldn't you go down and simple answer? He says, you're a bunny rabbit. Why would you really not care? Uh, because I don't take him serious. Well, isn't it because you know you're a man? Oh, <laughs> oh I forgot that. Yes, you're, uh, you're right. I feel pretty confident in my masculinity. Yes, now that you mention it. Now that I mention it. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so that's it. So, so it's a, uh, an analogy, but it's a simple example. So when we know something, you know, whether philosophically speaking, you know, it might be something different, but when you know something, you don't feel a need to prove it. Yes. So then when you need to prove something, I mean, in a, yes, uh, reactionary way what is that saying um uh, maybe i'll tell you a real story because uh, well, i thought answer, well, answer the question first to, so okay keep simple on track sorry to interrupt you but keep on track no yes. go ahead ask again please so why do you not feel the need to prove something you know that you're confident in For that reason, because I feel comfortable, I feel relaxed. Relaxed. So yeah. why would you feel the need to prove otherwise? Oh, if if uh, if what, what what I was confronted with would violate that which I know for sure and feel confident about. If that was threatened, then I would go into a defensive or into some mode or the other, into a reactive kind of mode. So, need to prove, wherever there's a need to prove, it's an indication, it's proof that there is doubt. Yes, right. insecurity, doubt. Yeah. yeah, so an overreaction is always accompanied by a need to prove, whether it's a should that I'm saying to myself or a should that I'm saying out there. Mm -hmm. So, need... Overreaction is always need to prove, which is always proof of doubt, which means I'm lying to myself and I'm lying to you. Yes. And all expectations are overreactions. And you think how many expectations the human being has, no matter who they are, about every little thing that has to do with life and themselves, yes? And all those expectations are rigid black and white shoulds. And they all, all the time are things we are trying to prove, which tells you we live pretty much all the time from a place of overreaction, which is a place of defense. And then we decide, well, now I'm going on a spiritual path. And we okay. sit down to meditate with our expectations. And we do our yoga with our expectations. Nothing we... will ever change. Right. So this is the point of deconstructive work, is that in, rather than trying to cause something else to happen, something to change, with the goal that it's going to look like this, we look at the beliefs that are triggering all of that. It's like, so come back to, so this is how it should be. So the question is, and if it was, so, so then it's a series of questions that we ask that get you to, that put those shoulds into perspective. And the whole focus of the work is simply to show what is stored in the myelin sheath? You know, in the, the nerves have like a sheath around them, yeah? And all the 
all the programming is held in that myelin sheath. So this is why when we have a realization, there's a ah, feeling, and we often feel a streaming happening because what's in the myelin sheath just needs to be acknowledged. We don't have to get rid of it because it's not true. Yeah, We just have to see what is it that's impacting on us. That seeing, that understanding, and the compassion that comes with it, it does all the work. So it's a very, there's, it's, it's, the, it's totally anti-conditioning, really. Yeah. I, I followed you. Uh, let me ask something, because you used, you used the word expectation quite liberally, and the way you spoke, it had... Uh, uh, a connotation that it was pregnant with with a charge of some some sort of the other, but uh, for most people uh, and in the business world, for example, um, you know the year end uh, budget is expected. Uh, a woman who is uh, expecting um, so the, the the word expectation is not always. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into the linguistics. I'm trying to understand uh, and and explore what you have said. But the word expectation, the way you used it, was in a way negatively connotated. Whereas uh, there are there are good ideals. There are uh, certainly, I think, everybody would agree that "Thou shalt not kill" uh, is is a pretty uh, sensible. Uh, guideline, uh, a good goal to 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 follow, um, and it's not automatically an expectation. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, unless a tiger is jumping at you. Um, yes, but uh, that's where the difference is between. Uh, I I'm a convinced pacifist. I was on a walk this morning, and we spoke about that in a different con context. Um, I find that uh, very often, particularly men in their masculinity today, um, they deny themselves access to their potential of aggressiveness uh, because it's politically incorrect, because it's also not what they and what I want to do. Um, I don't want to kill uh, a tiger. I don't want to kill another person. Uh, but I'd like to have still access that if that happens, which you just uh, described, if my life was under direct threat and uh, if the life of those I'm responsible for, then I would like to have at least access to the potential of my aggression and not have that access closed for uh, political correctness reasons. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, so we'd like to um, have those expectations and, until we don't want them. So what I'm saying is that all expectations are detrimental to us because they're global. When we have a should, it's global. And, and it impacts on us even when we think, no, 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 I no longer believe that. It's still impacting on us. And it's different, you know, anticipation. There's an excitement. There's a, oh, anything's possible. An expectation is, you know, it's one thing to have a healthy goal. And a healthy goal would be when it doesn't uh, manifest, then we look for another opportunity. Yes. We find better solutions. But in general, the expectations, so we talk about lowering and hiring our expectations, which is, Yes, expectations are expectations. They're saying, in the future, this is how I want it to be. And if it isn't, this is how I'm going to feel. So we already have a, a recipe for something that's never, ever going to happen, which is the future being here now. So we look at life through these expectations. You know, and we, we're doing exercises to the, with the power of now, but through these expectations, because if I do all these, ex, you know, then I'll be spiritual, I'll be a better person. So it all boils down to, to these good and bad ideas that are also handed down. Yeah. So, so actually, expectations, we have to be very careful. Most of them are detrimental. 
anticipation, that's really different. I, I'm with you. Uh, th this morning, when I went onto the net to research a little bit, prepare myself, I'd like to show you a quote I found. I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, Bertrand Russell said, I would never die uh, for my beliefs because I might be wrong. Uh, Bertrand Russell. He was such and, a great influence on me when I was a teenager. And, and isn't that also what you just said, uh, you know, the anticipation versus the expectation? Yes. Um, and and he, he uses different words, but the, the dynamics behind it is very, uh, very similar. He, with that sentence, I interpret it, he is cautioning against um, our convictions uh, being the product of our experiences, and then we uh, sort of project that experience as a given, as a law, uh, 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 almost into the future. And we say, therefore, the future will be X, Y, and Z, because the past was like that. And therefore, uh, we, we are completely locked in, in, in the self-fulfilling prophecy of that thinking. Uh, and that's what I take out of that sentence. Yes. So, so it's a so wherever there's a rigid this is how it is, yeah. Where wherever there's a this is how it is about anything, we're locked in. Yeah, there's no possibility of anything else. We're blinded to alternatives. So that's the that's the spotlight mind. So and that's that's where you work on with uh, everything you do nowadays with breakthrough. Um, you know, let me put the broader screen on because there's a nice picture of Ramana Maharashi uh, in the background uh, there. Uh, and of course, a central figure, figure in the Advaita philosophy, which I know is dear to you. Um, and um, actually, let me surprise you with something, with a little surprise. Let me share something which I found, which you may or you may not know. Um, let's see whether I can get it up, because there is a very, very little live footage. I have to play it. And the word Did that stands ever... out to me there is attained, you know. And that's that's our problem. We think there's something else we have to get. And yet there's just too much here, just covering up what's natural to us. You know? And I remember going to see my teacher, Ramesh Belskar, and, um, and it, it was monsoon season. And he said, oh, this is my slack period. There was no one there. And for nine days I visited him, even on a Sunday. And uh, and he sat there. He hadn't put his false teeth in. He sat there with his wife Shada, and and they all. He wanted to talk about his time in America, and and she kept on slapping him on the knee and going, "That's not how it was." You no, know? and all my time with him, what I what I came away with was, he's so human, he's so human. And the problem for for most of us because of all these expectations is we go through the spiritual life thinking we will escape our humanness yeah we'll suddenly talk in a particular way and do, no you know and 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 think of nisagadatta you know the chain smoking and 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 uh, and looking at ramna a body all contorted you know in a lot of pain and you know that that they were still 
deeply, profoundly human. Uh, but we're trying to throw away the baby with the bathwater, as Mirza Gerato would say. I, uh, um, it's an important point. Uh, I see that in spiritual circles very often, and actually it's something very often uh, today. When I hiked, somebody said to me, how can it be that there are uh, egos or dissonances in the Reiki community? You people, you should be above these, uh, these quarrels. And of course, my answer was, says who? <laughs> and the person looked at me and uh, she said, well, actually, he says I. And I said, well, precisely, that's what your projection is. That's what your expectation is. But uh, I, for one, and the Reiki teachers I know, uh, none of them ever has said that they are um, not human anymore, that they can levi levitate. And, and, and there's still this human aspect which you just addressed. Tell me, uh, Esther, the Advaita philosophy and your work today, um, I, I assume that your work today is a conclusion or a, a natural uh, evolution uh, for you personally, um, stemming from that philosophical background. Would you, would you agree with that? Would you expand on what I just said? Um, it was a profound influence on me, um, and I know we're limited for time. Um, really, it, the breakthrough stemmed from my own desperation, trying to help my help myself and understand. Um, well, it happened. I, I I had a neurotoxic poisoning, and suddenly I couldn't do my job. I couldn't earn money. I was with someone I barely knew who was supporting me. Um, all the things, and most of all, I couldn't read anymore. My whole nervous system was damaged, and and in one foul swoop, I all my identities were ripped away. So it's like, who am I now? And um, and. And then I thought of my uncle, my mother's brother, who was tetraplegic, paralyzed in much of the, couldn't talk, couldn't move. And he was just, to me, one of the most, the greatest teachers. And I thought, well, I would never have thought of him as useless. Why am I thinking I'm useless? And, and it was shortly after that, I couldn't read much, but I just a sentence from Ramana Maharshi. And uh, it just made sense to me. It's like, oh, so I'm not this and I'm not that and I'm not. So breakthrough is really exploring what is not, you know. So it's it's taking, it's, it's deconstructing. It's taking away all that stuff that we say, this is how I should be. This is how I am. I know myself. To, to just, and, and more and more what, what is the experience is, they're still overreactions. But there's not that we're not the slave to the mind. The mind starts saving us, serving us. So it's a, a system that um, works to refine the way we use the mind so that it will do the job it wants to do, which is to serve us. Whereas for most of us, we're just enslaved to it. Mm -hmm. And everything we do is even spiritual pathways are enslaved to the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, Esther in the conversation and that's the last thing and then we uh, will wrap up but maybe you want to expand on um, uh, I did a, an art talk some time ago with uh, a Feldenkrais teacher with yeah. Wendy Kahn and um, uh, in our conversation last time you, you expressed parallels um, or, or compatibility of your work through with Breakthrough and the Feldenkrais, Moshe Feldenkrais's approach to healing to life. Explain to me a little bit and um, with an emphasis that people who have an idea about Feldenkrais would get further insight in your breakthrough uh, work. My first experience of Feldenkrais was about 25 something years ago. And at the end of it, I thought, oh, this is the physical version of breakthrough. I was so excited. <laughs> and I went to the teacher, I said, I do something, I didn't explain anything, but it's, 
this is like the physical version of it. And she turned to me, she said, well, we should teach together. <laughs> She's been a very good friend ever since. So yes, Feldenkrais, uh, brilliant. Because to me, Felden, uh, Feldenkrais very much works with the nervous system. And, uh, and it's, it's always questioning. So we'll, we'll, we'll do a movement and then say, so how about trying it this way? How about trying it that way? And suddenly you discover something that you thought you were incapable of doing a moment ago. You're moving, but from the whole body and from a, a place of space. Well, clearly the space was always there, so but but we were unaware of it. So it's the same. Very briefly put, I'm, uh, but it's the same with with breakthrough. You're discovering ah a spaciousness in the way of being, in the way the mind functions, rather than just all this clutter and this rigidity, which is so reflected in the human body. So as we get older, we're constantly rigidifying directly reflected in, in the way our minds are so rigid. So our expectations are held in the myelin sheath, reflected throughout the body, and we can only respond in very rigid ways. So we begin more and more to move in isolations. We begin more and more to think in an isolated way. And so, move physically also. It's yes. not just psychologically, so, yes. physically, so, so, we start. We don't use the full, the our full capacity. So it's the same. We don't use our mind fully. We're in one little corner, imprisoned there. That's not the whole mind. Mm. And the mind's not the enemy. And there's nothing to get rid of in it. That it's see how it functions. It's the same as there's nothing bad with the body, but pay attention to how it's functioning. Is there another way? So this would be really breakthrough is there has to be another way. That was how it began. And, and to me, Feldenkrais is the same. There has to be another way. You know, Feldenkrais, I mean, brilliant work. Just, you know, I think the two should always be done together. <laughs> I don't think you can really work on the mind well without doing Feldenkrais. And this is, this is, I think, a very important uh, conclusion. And we're getting to the end because uh, uh, listening to you um, about breakthrough and about some of the things you explained, uh, it was uh, using the mind, and that's fine. It's a great tool, um, but it's only a tool. And we have we are more than just mind and emotions. We are actually also a physical being. And like what you said towards the end now, that uh, those two components, and there are a few others more, uh, in combination with each other are um, very valuable. And I think it would be a pity if, if uh, anyone is claiming that one is the only system or the only uh, method uh, to attain um, a goal. Uh, which, which the goal being um, more liberty, more happiness, more open mind, or to lose um, interest in goals, and and eventually uh, the, the 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 letting go of goals uh, in in the traditional. No, it's losing interest, but we can't let go. So the losing interest can only just happen, and the mind is a really important tool. It's part of Feldenkrais mind body. Uh, and we're using the mind to to make a healthier mind. Basically, is, is yana yoga. Yes. Thank you very much, Esther. Is there uh, one more thing you would like uh, our viewers to leave with uh, your final parting message? <laughs> no, I can't think of anything. <laughs> Just, yes, to be gentle with ourselves, you know, not to take life so seriously and to understand that we are all, doesn't matter whether we're a dictator or who we are, that we, we all, you know, have the same pains, you know, the same hurts, the same struggles deep down. You know? so and all, uh, with all, you mean every human being? 
every human being. Yeah. So this is the the for me the key in breakthrough. You come away. There's a compassion that happens for yourself, for others. That compassion that does all the work. There's nothing you need to do. The compassion does the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, um, for all the people, for everybody, uh, very often, of course, there is a but following. And I think your work is focusing much on uh, getting rid of the but and accepting everybody full stop, not the comma but, but full stop, everybody, uh, and we mean everybody. No, it's just acknowledging the but. Not getting rid of them or accepting them, just seeing them. <laughs> Okay. Seeing them for what they are. No, not true. Excellent, Esther. Thank you very much. I say goodbye to you uh, for now and we'll be in touch. Um, dear viewers, bye bye, Esther. <laughs> thank you, Lenny. Um, dear viewers, I thank you for viewing. Please do subscribe. Uh, you will see where in a moment. And uh, I hope you're looking forward to the next edition of our talk in three weeks' time.